ఎక్కువ యా సార్ నౌ యూట్యూబ్ అండ్ లైవ్ సార్ యూ యూ కెన్ స్టార్ట్ రికార్డింగ్ ఆల్సో జైస్ యా పిటి సార్ యూ కెన్ స్టార్ట్ సార్ ఎస్ సార్ ఎస్ సార్ యా గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఎవరి వన్ ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ తమిళనాడు ఆర్థోపెటిక్ అసోసియేషన్ ఐ వెల్కమ్ యూ ఆల్ టు ది టిఎన్ఓఏ పీజీ టీచింగ్ ప్రోగ్రామ్స్ ట్వంటీ సిక్స్త్ ప్రోగ్రామ్ టుడేస్ టాపిక్ ఇస్ ప్రిన్సిపల్స్ ఆఫ్ ఇంట్రా మెడిలరీ నీలింగ్ అండ్ ఓవర్ వ్యూ సో వీ హ్యావ్ టూ రినౌన్డ్ ఆర్థోపెటిక్ సర్జన్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ద మాంచెస్టర్ ఆఫ్ సౌత్ ఇండియా కోయంబత్తూర్ సో డాక్టర్ సి రెక్స్ ఈజ్ ఎ చీఫ్ కన్సల్టెంట్ ఆర్థోపెటిక్ అండ్ ట్రామా సర్జన్ ఫ్రమ్ రెక్స్ హాస్పిటల్ కోయంబత్తూర్ అండ్ డాక్టర్ G. Balasubramaniam, Chief Orthopedic Surgeon and Managing Director of Brahadi Hospital. So they are going to take this uh, session. As a customary, I introduce the moderator. Dr. G. Balasubramaniam, is a, is a, he got MBBS from uh, Payamadur Medical College. Then post-graduation from uh, Bangalore University. And uh, he did his uh, DNB Orthopedics also. He went to UK. and uh, he completed the frcs in general surgery and frcs in trauma and orthopedic surgery he has uh, extensive work on uh, hip replacement hip re- resurfacing and uh, replacement surgeries so after he returned to india he has introduced the hip re- resurfacing in coimbatore uh, area so with this uh, short introduction i hand over the mic to dr g balasubramaniam so please take over sir yeah uh thanks pts that's uh, a nice of you uh, first of all um uh, good evening friends i welcome you for this uh, tnoa pg teaching program uh, i congratulate uh, tms pts thanapan and all the team tnoa team for organizing this uh, wonderful pg teaching program especially at this uh, covid time when uh, teaching is uh, uh, pgs are starving for uh, teaching um this is a wonderful thing to do uh, kudos to tno a uh, and uh, thanks uh, pts and all for uh, inviting me for moderating this session uh, thank you all and today we are going to uh, discuss one of the very important topic in orthopedics okay is a day uh, every day uh, surgery um i would say nailing is the bread and butter of uh, orthopedics and that's uh, uh, nailing has revolutionized the treatment of uh, long bone fractures as we all know so everybody every uh, orthopedic surgeon should be well versed with the uh, uh, nailing uh, technique because as i said that's the bread and butter uh, once you enter an um, orthopedic uh, practice uh, every day you will get uh, a case of uh, nailing so it's better you have to be thorough in nailing technique so uh, today i hope you will all will become thorough in uh, nailing technique we have a uh, wonderful uh, faculty today um rex he got a uh, enormous uh, experience in uh, trauma and orthopedics and he is the ch- uh, chief uh, orthopedic surgeon in uh, and head of the department uh, rex orthopedic hospital coimbatore and he completed his uh, is a product of coimbatore medical college he did uh, uh, ms in uh, kotayam and after that went to uk for uh, frc sartho and he got uh, mch in uh, liverpool uk uh, he got extensive uh, uh, experience got a uh, uh, wonderful academic career i am going to read everything so he got his phd and dsc at uh, victoria global university he established an exclusive trauma and orthopedic center called rex orthopedic hospital uh, which is a renowned hospital in coimbatore and also a post graduate institute for orthopedic training he has authored two books namely k wiring principles and techniques by team publishers the f- uh, first book on k wiring in the world with four word written by jesse jupiter uh hardware university usa and uh, another book clinical assessment and examination of orthopedics by jp publishers he has written more than 30 original artist articles in peer reviewed journals and he has described the new ct based classification on hofas fracture he has won jnj award indo german gold medal xavier medal 
Surendran gold medal, Subramaniam gold medal, Allen Glass Prize for various presentations. Dr. MGR Medical University gave, gave him best doctor award and honor. He has been a teaching faculty and given guest lectures in Indo-Korean orthoplasty, Asia Pacific orthoplasty and arthroscopy meets, IOA conferences, TNOA conferences, Indian orthoplasty conferences and nailing courses. EO introductory basic course and international trauma conference. And he was the past president of Indian chapter, Institute of Biomaterials, Tribal Corrosion, Tribal Corrosion and um, Nanomedicine, Illinois, USA, past secretary of Coimbatore Orthopedic Society and executive member of TNOA. He is reviewer of Indian Orthopedic Journal and TNOA Journal. He is an examiner for postgraduate fellowship in orthoplasty and arthroscopy for MGR Medical University. So he got an excellent CV and he got an excellent academic career. So good. So he is going to uh, tell us everything about uh, I am nailing. Hope it will be very useful, not only for PGs, for our practicing orthopedic surgeons. Also, so Rex, it's all yours. Uh, um, over to Rex. Thank Rex. you. Thank you, Bala. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, uh, humbly thank you for the nice introduction. And I thank Dr. Saronan and uh, the whole TNOA team, uh, especially Dr. Tanapan and uh, everyone who's involved in organizing such a wonderful PG teaching program. And uh, it is the 26th uh, program which uh, they are doing today. And I'm uh, honored to be here to give a lecture on the principles of intermediate nailing. As Bala said rightly, every day in and out, I mean, we do uh, nailing. And uh, time in and out, I know we come in, come across uh, certain problems and we try to learn. And uh, even after uh, doing maybe 3,000, 4,000 nails, still we are learning. So uh, that, is, that is science. You know, you try to improve yourself every time when you do some, something new or uh, you get more, more experience. So today we'll go on to the topic. Um, so principles of intramedullary nailing. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible, yeah. So uh, I'm going to st strictly stick, uh, stick on to the principles of intramedullary nailing, uh, not, not to deviate away from the topic. And it's a, it's a vast topic. And uh, as being a uh, teaching session, I thought I'll stick on to real basics and also tell about a few tips and tricks which everybody can practice uh, when they do nailing. Intramolary nailing, uh, I'll just do an overview on these headings, the introduction, indications, contraindications, classifications of the nail, the rimming principles, and the techniques, the incision, the entry point, the fracture reduction, locking, and complications. Intramolary nail is the uh, standard practice for creating long bone fractures of the lower limbs. No doubt about that. And uh, if you see the literature, even 500 years back, uh, they started with the uh, Aztec who used wooden nails to stick on into the intramillary uh, bone, intramillary aspect of the bone to act as a splint. And thereafter, it evolved using ivory, then metal implants came. And uh, the, the father of uh, intramillary nail, we all know is Gerald Kuncher from Germany. He's done a lot of research on nailing and he is the man who did the reamed intramillary nailing to start. I mean, not just an intramillary plug, he did the reamed intramillary nail. That's an open, open rim nailing. And there are, thereafter, a lot of evolution came with the Rush family and the Herzog the, uh, inventing the uh, tibial nail, or the K-nail type, K type design, and then Huxter, Grosskamp, and the lot, lots, lot of people involved. So uh, everybody should know the history uh, so we understand the basics, how uh, things worked and how it's been molded according to the time. So where the biomechanics, how the intramillary nail, we all know it acts like a splint. And it is a load sharing device. Everybody uh, knows that it's a load sharing device. But what do you mean by load sharing device? I mean, that's a very basic question. There are two things. One is load bearing device and one is load sharing device. When we say load bearing device, the plate, the plate is a typical load-bearing device. It bears the whole weight of the uh, uh, of the limb or the force that go, that transfers across. 
that when you say, say load sharing device, the bone also takes the part of the weight along with the implant. So that means if you're putting a nail on a simple two part fracture, that means the proximal fragment, distal fragment is in contact, part of the load goes through the nail and part of the load goes through the bone. So this is called load sharing. But the same nail, it becomes a load bearing device if you use in a commutative fracture. A commutative mid shaft fracture of the femur, you put a nail and put a locking screw above and below, it is no more a load sharing device. It is a load, load bearing device. So that means that must be delayed weight bearing until you see the callus formation. So this is the real basic. So the, any implant can be used in the way how you want to. It is not the implant that decides whether it is a load sharing or load bearing. It is the uh, mechanism or the principle how you put the nail in and how the bone, the, the primary bone contact between the proximal and distal fragment, which decides it's a load sharing device or not. And the purpose of uh, nailing, we all know, is stabilize and align the fracture fragments. And uh, the, the obvious advantage <coughs> is that permitting adjacent joint movements and rehabilitation is quicker, early return of function. So these are all the AO principles. And uh, the open section nail is a K nail. And I will come, I'll come to the different types of nail later. So one should understand the biology. Any cortical bone is supplied by the nutrient artery in the inner two third, and the periosteal vessel supplies the outer one third. In addition, you have some metaphyseal vessels that feed the bone. So if you put an intramillary nail, and especially if you use the reamed nail, you'll be damaging the inner two third that supply to the cortex. And so theoretically, you, you are just uh, making it avascular in, in the inner side, inner two third. And uh, if, if you see the literature, it, is not, it has got no clinical implications on the fracture healing at the end of eight weeks. A lot of animal studies have been done to show that the revascularization of the intramillary uh, flow has reestablished in six to eight weeks time and doesn't have any much of clinical implication on healing by doing a ream nail. So it's been proven, well proven, that you don't need to worry about the, the reaming at all. So how does this fracture heal? And we know that any nail, it's not a rigid fixation, it is a stable fixation, it allows micro movement. So it, it helps in periosteal newborn formation, that's a secondary healing, nothing but the external callus. And that is a desired way of healing because the early stabilization of the long bone fracture happens with the external callus. Unlike the primary bone healing, which takes a long, which takes very long time to heal, external callus is the desired way of healing for a faster uh, recovery. So, what are the indications? We all know that indications for nailing is long bone fractures, and especially diaphyseal fractures is a well-known fact. But with the advent of newer types of nail and the technology, this has been extended up to just articular and nowadays you can even see the intraarticular with the shaft extensions has been managed very well with nailing. So once you become expert in doing nailing, you try to extend your indications to periarticular area. And other indications are aseptic non-unions, pathological fractures, malunion, correction of deformities in the long bones, limb lengthening procedures uh, along with the Elizaro, you try to use the nail. Arthritis is obviously like here, you can arthrodesis with the ankle nail or uh, you can arthrodesis even the knee with the intramillary nail. So you have various indications, but the most common being the traumatic diaphyseal fracture. And this is another example of uh, non-union uh, correction with the nail. So you have different indications and uh, of long bone fractures which can be treated with nail. So extended, when, I talk, when I was telling about extended indications, so before the reaming or the locking came, it was the, the kuncher nail was designed only for isthmus fracture, a straightforward where the bone is in a very narrow, you have a straightforward isthmus fracture, then uh, the kuncher nail was the real indication in olden days. But with the advent of locking, it extended to the, um, <clears throat> the whole of mid diaphysis and with the uh, special designs of interlocking bolts in different directions, it has come up to the periarticular area. So this is one of the examples of periarticular uh, fracture, which can be reduced first and then minimally you can treat with the nail as well. So 
up to generally speaking fracture up to 2 cm from the joint line can be well treated with uh, uh, nailing nowadays so these are the few examples and uh, here is a almost like a pylon like fracture and uh, here the, with the intramedullary ext with the intradigital extension so the minimally displaced fractures you fix them first use a small k wise or put some cantilever screws in between the small size screws so it doesn't doesn't jeopardize the passage of nail and then you lock the nail with the you may have get you may get one or two screws at the maximum so uh, this is uh, minimally invasive and you respect the soft tissues around and this leg will be so swollen and uh, it is a patient friendly rather than putting an external fixator it's really patient friendly and also very biological type of fixation and sometimes you may need to use a um, external uh, plaster of paris slab or cast splints to support in addition to this sort of fixation so this is one of the major advantage of uh, extended indications of uh, nailing so what are the contraindications excessive marrow uh, i mean the if the medullary canal is too narrow for example uh, you may have some patients with osteopetrosis or a fluorosis patient with no medullary canal and you must be very careful about putting a nail in or in the humerus if the medullary canal is less than 6 mm definitely you cannot do a, a nailing so you need to go on to plating so the excessive narrow medullary canal you can't do excessive bowing it can be a metabolic bone disease or a congenital bowing of the bone or any infection in the bone obviously nailing is out of option and dam as a as a part of damage control orthopedics there relative contraindication for nailing and uh, any metaphyseal fractures you have better implant than intramedullary nail so it is only again i would say is a relative contraindication and so eo has classified the nail into four different categories one is tight fitting unlock that is a classical puncture nail where you open the femur you ream with a hand reamers and you shovel in the nail a law in a rock solid the biggest size fitting tight fitting nail snug fitting nail you put in and come out and the next came with the locking principle the universal nail so tight fitting locked nail so this is a reamed nail which is locked that is what we do in femur and tibia then we have another category of nailing without locking or without reaming so these nails they just acts like a internal splint like rush nail which is the previous slide i showed which i used in fibula so that is an ex typical example of a uh, nail into the fibula which is a rush nail or the talwakar uh, square nail which is used in the forearm uh, some of the centers still use the forearm square nails uh, or the enders nail which again is again is unlocked and dream nail so the tens nail is again is example nailing without reaming with locking so this is the unreamed solid nail so this is the fourth category which rarely uh, is used but uh, it has got some its own indications which i will discuss later so this is the conventional classification uh, depending on where, how you put the nail in so this is the uh, anatomical classification central medullary nail the entering the bone in line with the medullary canal this is the typical femur nail with the piriformis entry cephalo medullary nail cephalo medullary nail uh, have a central medullary portion with the fixation onto the femoral head that's the richards nail or pfn or gamma nail all these are cephalo medullary nails condylocephalic nails they go from the uh, distal to proximal for through the condyles or the metaphyseal area Uh, into the intramedullary area so this is the tens nail application then distal femur or the old zickel nail all these are condylocephalic nails rarely used and if you see the current femoral nails are named after entry site see there is a confusion you know what classification and you don't understand what you are talking but if you see the the nail classification they all now they talk about the entry site as the they coin the name uh, with the entry site what type of nail it is so it's a anti grade femoral nail the piriformis entry anti grade femoral nail or trochanteric entry anti grade femoral nail so that is what they talk and the retrograde femoral nail obviously uh, it's from the uh, distal femur going up so let us see how these the principles work in different types of nails so the classical kuncher nail the tight fitly fitting unlocked nail 
And if you see, it is an elastic expansile principle, the flower leaf design, which you can see here very nicely, the flower leaf design, um, which is which has got an elastic, is, is slotted in the, in the back, and uh, it has got an elastic principle to expand when it goes in. So it's a, it's a tight fitting nail, after reaming, you just shovel in, so it expands once it goes into the nail, into the bone. So it is a matching a elastic nail into a stiff bone. So that is the principle. A match, matching elastic nail into a stiff bone. That is important. So nailing a diaphyseal area became a standard form of treatment if the isthmus uh, is narrow. So that is a so you, because you don't have a locking, you don't have a rotational control. And if you see the next uh, evolution was. They extended the indications by using a locking bolt proximally and distally. This concept came with the Gross and Kempf nail and increases the stability of the fixation. It widens the uh, indications of nailing. So more proximal, more distal fractures, more complex fractures like severely comminuted fractures or unstable fractures are, were very nicely treated with this concept. And uh, the nail without reaming or locking, as I said earlier, the rush nail or ender's nail, the biggest are the, the lotus nail, all these are the different examples, but it doesn't have any longitudinal rotation stability and often requires an additional external stabilization like plasters. And it's got, but the advantage is got a low infection rate and easy application. And if you see the titanium elastic nail system, which falls into this group, is that it's mainly used in pediatrics as a primary definitive fracture care. Most of the long bones of the, the pediatrics, both upper and lower limbs. And the principle it works is three point fixation. Or sometimes you stack the nail, too many nails inside and use the bundle nailing principle. So two principles are used as a bundle nail or you use the principle of three point fixation. So the elasticity of the construct allows micro movement, rapid external healing, external callus formation, secondary healing, so quick and uh, early recovery. The flexibility allows insertion through a small metaphysical window very nicely without any problems. So the technical aspects, <clears throat> when you apply this tense nail, the insertion points must be opposite one another. That is very important. Uh, if, you, if you have an entry point that are not opposite, then differing internal tension happens. And is ideally same size nail must be used both on the left and right, if you're using two tens nail on either sides of the uh, <clears throat> metaphysis of the lower femoral condyle to fix the femur fracture in the child, you should always use <clears throat> same size nail so that there is a balance in the fracture stability and fixation. Otherwise, there'll be imbalance or it may go for varus or valgus if you use a different size uh, nail. And also your entry point is different. Again, you may it may have some angular deformity. The apex of the curvature, very important, the apex of the curvature must be at the level of fracture side. And so when it is away from the midline, it, it's, it really holds like a safety pin principle. It's exactly the safety pin principle. So it holds nicely uh, with a good snug fix of the bone so it doesn't go for displacement or lateral movement of the uh, bone. The nail, the, how you select the tens nail, it must be 40% of the diameter of the bone. So that is important. So you, an, you analyze, you, the, you minus 15% of the radiographic magnification, you take into account and you 40% of the diameter only use uh, to uh, use. So when you use on both sides, 80% of the canal is filled. So this is how it works. <clears throat> this is an extended, extended example in a elderly, which we use the similar, the similar concept the, the nail uh, from the retrograde manner from the transcondylar plane. And uh, <clears throat> this is a lady, very, very young lady, who had a very severe uh, open injury with no soft tissue around the upper tibia. And uh, so we, we need to pass a, uh, you know, intramillary uh, flexible enders nail from below upwards. And, uh, but with these sort of nailing, you need to protect with the external supports. Otherwise, this will fail miserably and because it doesn't have any angular control. Uh, the bonding principle, as I said earlier, multiple enders nails stacked in the long bones to jam it in. It can be used in femur, tibia, so on. So nailing without reaming with locking. So this is the solid nails. 
Okay, the solid nail, it's uh, with the locking bolt. So here, you don't ream, you just put the solid nail straight inside. It has been used most commonly in Gustilo 3B uh, fractures, where you want to go in and come out uh, very fast, and especially it's a life-saving emergency. Maybe you can consider the unreamed solid nail for the time management, and also the infection rate is less because any hollow nail, there is a chance of nidus of bacteria, but in the solid nail, the chances are very little, and you don't jeopardize the blood supply inside the bone because by reaming, so it's more biological. But the, the disadvantage being solid nails must be must be easy to insert. So you can't use a very thick nail on a small bone. So the nail size will be obviously smaller than the isthmus, and sometimes uh, the, uh, <clears throat> it can allow uh, malunion, and delayed union is very common because the locking bolt, uh, because uh, the, the size of the nail is very tiny, it doesn't have a good control on the stability, and the locking bolt breakage again is common because of the delayed healing uh, aspect. So this is one of the disadvantages of unreamed na solid nail. So we do, what are the fractures, the forces acting on a fracture? So one should understand when you use a nail, what are the forces it resists? The bending force, we all know any fracture has got a bending or angulation force. It has got a rotational torque, the rotational stability. It also has a shear stress. The shear stress is nothing but side to side movement. For example, if you use a small size nail, it can glide side to side. So then the matching of the cortex may not be there. And also axial load is another force which is acting on any fracture. So the axial load or the compression force is also there in any fracture. So you need to neutralize all these forces by using a nail. So the anatomical alignment is the goal of management of all these fractures. So long bone fractures, when somebody asks you, well, how, what are you going to, or what is your principle of managing these long bone fractures? You, you tell them that you want to achieve anatomical alignment of length, rotation, and axis. When I say axis, it is both coronal plane and sagittal plane. So that is important. And this is a typical example. And here, uh, your alignment, length maintenance is all very crucial. You need to match the opposite side length because the central comminuted fracture and you don't have uh, any control on the rotation. So you match the, uh, the tibial tuberosity to the second uh, toe for, uh, for rotational control. And length, you need to measure the opposite side and also make sure that you maintain the same length here. And obviously, no varus valgus or the lateral view, no recurvatum, procurvatum. So this is how you should understand and, and you lock the distal uh, locking before you make sure that everything is perfect. Unlock nail. The unlock nail, how does it work? I mean... Um, so the unlock nail usually works with a long tunnel interference fit. It's something like a mismatch between the nail and the medullary canal or the bone. The bone is more curved and your nail is less curved. So it works with a long tunnel interference fit, the unlock nail. And you, once you lock it, you are, you are resisting the rotational force and also the axial compression force. So you the bending torque is been arrested. The, the shear stress has been arrested. The, the rotational torque has been arrested by locking and axial compression again has again been arrested by locking. The locking is of two principles, dynamic locking, static locking. When I say dynamic locking, it controls uh, the axial stability. It's, it is used to have a, a controlled axial movement in the fracture side, but no bending or, or rotational deformation because these are all ream nails, so it can resist the rotation. Uh, static nails, when I say when I say static nail, because you lock with locking bolts above and below, more than that, controlling the, rota the angulation, the bending force, it also controls the rotation, the axial load. So it is more load-bearing device. So when you lock the nail, proximally and distally, it is going to be load, more load-bearing, and, and the fatigue life of this nail is going to be reduced because the nail is taking the, all the force. The, for the force transference through the bone is becomes less. When you use a dynamic nail, 
the force transference through the bone is more. So the fatigue life of the material or the nail is more. So it, it can take more time. It can, it can withstand more time the, the cyclical loading. So that is what it implies. The static locking is definitely indicated in a comminuted fracture where there's no contact between the proximal and distal fragments. And also, if you feel that uh, the proximal and distal fragment, uh, that any, any, any side, you have a very wide medullary canal and the nail may go for varus valgus or rotation instability. So definitely like a non-isthmal fracture, you may need to definitely lock that aspect. Um, <clears throat> so the interlocking screws can be circular screw. The static uh, holes are always circular. The dynamic holes are always oblong. And two screws proximally, distally. The dynamization nowadays is rarely done. And it's, it's rarely done in femur especially. Uh, a lot of studies have said dynamization, if you need to do you need the best time is six weeks to six months. More than that is a big question. And you may need to do augmentation plate and bone grafting rather than doing a dynamization after six months time. And dynamization in tibia, most very, very important. You need to make sure the fibula is, is, is like a strut. It will be keeping the fracture, the non-union site apart. And if you don't do an osteotomy of the fibula, it's likely to have the with dynamization, you're now never going to succeed. So very important when you do a dynamization of tibia, make sure the fibula is not keeping the bones apart or you need to do osteo osteotomy. Um, so the lock nail, as I said earlier, the indications are gone up to almost two centimeters of the joint level and newer designs. It acts like a fixed angle construct because the multi-directional lock nail, it fixes uh, the bone, the metaphyseal construct uh, to the shaft, the shaft, the, the intramillary nail, like an angular construct. So fixed angle construct, it works. And uh, this design is good in proximal tibia. When you, when you want to do dynamization, Dimensation is mentioned mainly when there's impaired fracture healing. And always the screws are removed from the longest segment. But sometimes this is not true because we generally tell the students that uh, screws are removed from the longest segment because the longest segment is will be very stable. Uh, rotationally also the stable stability will be more and it doesn't go for various valgus tilt. But sometimes, uh, it, it, may not, it may not work in that way. Uh, I'll show you an example later. So this is an example of a nailing uh, done many years back. And uh, you can see here, I, the, this fracture uh, has got, the fracture is distal to the isthmus. So I put only one locking bolt in the dynamic hole. You can see in the lateral view is the dynamic hole. And uh, being a good contact of the fragments here, so because I used only dynamic locking, um, with the, this is a relaxed like a load sharing device from day one and uh, with the partial weight bearing once the initial callus forms in six weeks time this can even go for more and more compression if it wants to and it solidly heals within six months you have a solid callus so uh, the fracture healing will be quicker if you understand the principle how you want to work and uh, la the previous slide I said Dynamization done, done in the longer segment, but this is contrary to what I have done. If you see the longer segment is distal fragment here, and I should have dynamized here according to the principle, but I didn't do here, but I went for dynamization above for two reasons. One, this, if you see the tip of the nail is almost touching the facial scar. So if it's going to touch the final facial scar by dynamizing, by dynamizing here, then, then it may not work. I mean, it may not be able to come together, especially if the gap is more than 0.5 centimeters. And if your nail is almost touching the uh, scar, it cannot collapse further. So one should understand that. So always look at the tip of the nail, where it is, before you dynamize that area. And here, uh, so I removed the locking bolt above because the isthmus is a very tight fitting area. So it have, have got good rotation stability. And uh, so we removed the, both the screws proximally at the three months interval, and that went in for uh, good healing. So understand the principle of how the dynamization works. 
and this is these are the other examples of how if the interlocking screw is not available there are new nails which has come up in the market for many years especially in israel they've been developing on these expandable nails uh, using a saline to ex ex expand and hug the medullary canal so to avoid distal locking um, this can be used uh, in the metaphyseal area and the other types of nails in the which was evolving before was the Brucker's nail or Medino nail, which has got a flange which will expand, especially in the uh, distal tibia and the distal humerus, where the, uh, it will expand once you go in with the turning a bolt on the top end, like a telescope, it will go in and come, come out, but it has got its own problems on, on removal. So these are all out of fashion nowadays. And reaming, coming to reaming, and everybody uh, knows about reaming, but how much to ream is a big question. So when you ream a nail, you just ream enough to fit the nail. That means when you have a chatter at the isthmus level, maybe that is the time you should think this is going to be the size of the nail which you're going to put in. So the initial chatter, what you get, the until then the reaming will be quicker and easier. It will go in and out very nicely. When you get a chatter of the bone, then that is the time you think this is the size of the nail which I'm going to put in. And then from there, you ream one or two millimeters more and you put the ideal nail. The nail must be always 1.5 millimeter less than the reamed, the reamer diameter. So that is very important. Always 1.5 or sometimes even two if the, the bend is too much. So this improves the nail bone contact and gives good rotation stability. The reaming safe practices which I want to tell the juniors is uh, I always uh, the correct entry point is the key. If you get the entry point right, the things are easy. Everything falls into place very nicely. The biggest advantage of reaming, more than making the uh, construct biomechanically strong, the intramedullary juice, you know, the reamings, the, all the reamed materials, all gets accumulated at the fracture site like a, a graft, autograft. And this helps in faster healing of the fracture site. And being a closed nail, uh, nailing, uh, always you try to do a closed, minimally invasive closed nailing. Definitely, uh, it has got advantage of fracture hematoma. And more than that, you are, you are reaming all the medullary uh, stuff will get, accumul get accumulated at the fracture site and makes it heal faster. Always start with a ball tip guide wire. Very, very important. Never use a straight guide wire. You burn your fingers. If the reamer breaks in, always ball tip guide wire. Start with the cutting end reamer. Start with 8 mm cutting at cutting wire. Then you go to the expandable side cutting reamers. 0.5 increments, not very fast. The higher the, if you jump 1 and 1 mm faster, you will have a thermal necrosis of the bone inside. So high torque, low RPM is very important, not a high RPM. High RPM again causes thermal necrosis and healing will be slow. Um, <clears throat> and always withdraw the flexible reamer only in forward reaming. That is important because in olden times, the, the reamers are all, the flexible reamers are all spring loaded. And if you undo or reverse the reaming, it will unwind the, the spring and you will get into trouble. But with the newer sin ream, that is not an issue. The syndrome is a solid, flexible reamer. So there you can do both, do forward and backward. But we always teach, do always forward reaming and forward only you come out as well to prevent, prevent this complication. And stabilize the guide wire when you withdraw, that is important, it may come out along with the reamer. And stop the, when you ream across the committed area, always make sure the reamer is, is uh, you go in very slow, so you don't disturb, disturb the blood supply or you don't rotate the fragments. And uh, so that is very important. Slow, slow reaming when you go through the commutator fracture or you don't dislodge into the middle of the canal, the commutator fragments. And they always you use a metallic skin protector for soft tip to prevent soft tissue damage. Um, people talk about the advantages of reaming or disadvantages of reaming uh, the, as if the, the reaming causes embolization of the marrow fat to the lung. But uh, some of the study, most of the studies have proven that it's not of much of clinical importance in most of the patients, but especially the, the patients with the lung injury, yes, it is a worry. And uh, increased incidence of infection, again, is controversial. 
whether uh, because the rheum has been told in the olden literature, rheum nail has got more incidence of infection compared to unreamed nail, but again has been disproved in the recent literature. And uh, reamer irrigator aspirator system, this is one of the uh, new ways of reaming where you irrigate simultaneously, you can aspirate as well the stuff which you uh, get in. And uh, this lacks like a bone marrow collection or they as the bone marrow aspirate. And uh, you can collect the, uh, <clears throat> the bone marrow substance separately, uh, which has been used for grafting uh, different areas. So this is a reamer uh, irrigator aspirator system with the collection system separately outside. And uh, up to 10 to 18 mm, you can ream uh, sequentially and collect all the uh, marrow material. Uh, the, it prevents the, uh, the reamer aspirator system prevents the fat embolism to a certain extent and also thermal necrosis less because you're irrigating all the time. And uh, the reamed bone fragments can be as a potential autograph. And uh, it is effective in debriding even chronic osteomyelitis where you can ream and wash simultaneously. And uh, it is safe in polytrauma patients. So everything has got a plus. If they have a plus, they'll have a minus. Uh, the bigger the uh, the biggest uh, the that is that are the big, biggest contraindication is if you have a metabolic bone disease or active metastatic bone disease, then you are spreading the the infection or the uh, malignant cells everywhere. So it's not a good idea. And obviously, in the soft bone, you are not supposed to use, and bleeding disorders you are not supposed to use. Um, when you suck or aspirate, liters of blood can sometimes can sucked out of the system. So blood loss is enormous. If you don't think about suddenly you lose one or two liters uh, when you do the RIA, the reamer uh, aspirator system. And also it's got a, if you ream too much, you end up in hydrogenic femur fracture. So Indian bones, the diameter is less. And uh, I believe in India, we have only from 12, but in abroad it's available from 10 mm. So if you are start with 10 or 12 mm, Reamer irrigator system, you may ream to 13, 14, and you may take off most of the bone, and hydrogenic femur fracture can happen. So one must be one must understand those things. Coming to the nail, uh, what nail to choose is a big question, and how much the diameter. So preoperative planning, you must uh, know how, what size diameter you're going to use, what is the length of the nail which I'm going to use, and what cross section is preferred, and what material I want to use. So for this, you need to understand the biomechanics or the material property of the uh, of the material which you're going to use. Titanium or you're going to use uh, um, stainless steel. For easy understanding, we know that uh, <clears throat> titanium is, the ultimate strength is strong, but always stainless steel is more stiffer. This, uh, this slide is wrong. Actually, the titanium, if you see, if you see the stiffness, the stiffness is more in stainless steel, titanium is less stiff, but more elastic, but the ultimate strength of the titanium is more. So that is why titanium alloy is preferred compared to stainless steel because the Young's modulus is almost same, almost, uh, not almost same, at least half that of the stainless steel and the deformation uh, resistance is, uh, is more with the, with the titanium. So it's a more elastic material, very strong. So titanium is preferred than stainless steel, but uh, the stainless steel is more stiff, not elastic, and uh, the, st the, st the, st the, st the, the stiffer is stiffer the material, the strength is also small. When you come to the cross section, in the previous days, a lot of cross sections like flower leaf or a even diamond shape or the uh, slotted nail. And nowadays you see the more trendy nowadays is using a complete circular cylindrical nail. No more is slotted. So the reason being, the slotted nail, <coughs> it, the, it's more rigid in one plane, but it has a less torsional stress, there's a resistance. But circular nail always has the polar moment of inertia is proportional to the diameter. So the torque stress or the twisting stress resistance or the resistance to bending, all these are highest in the circular nail. So all the nails nowadays is almost circular, or if not, may be slotted, but the uh, other nails are all given up. So they're all different types of nail with all different uh, shapes 
on cross sections solid circular nail the bending rigidity the torsional rigidity you can see the bending rigidity is uh, and this for is three times uh, the radius and also the torsional rigidity is four times the radius so uh, so increasing the size of the diameter it becomes more stiffer more stronger this is a slide which everybody should know uh that this is a torque resistance of a cylinder so when you talk about the cylinder cylinder has got a inner diameter and outer diameter the inner diameter is constant if you increase the size of the nail only the outer diameter is going to change so if you see carefully the four times the diameter is the increase in every 1 mm size so for example a 10 mm nail if you're going to use the strength is like Uh, approximately 10000 newton you shift from 10 to 11 mm the strength increases to 14641 newton so that means 1.5 times you are increasing the strength by increasing just to 1 mm and using 12 mm nail it is almost double the strength of the 10 mm nail it is amazing so just by increasing 1 mm you are increasing the strength of the nail by 1.5 or 2 times or even 3 times so Uh, diameter matters a lot this is very important in subtrochanteric fracture where always you try to put in the largest size nail possible in a subtrochanteric because the force acting is enormous second consideration is what type of nail i am going to use you know this uh, is uh, one should understand the design you know the femur nail there are different radius of curvature available in the market from 150 to 200 cm when i say The, that is the curve of the bone and the curve of the nail should match at least so for easy uh, pushing in the nail if there is a miss cross mis mismatch you will break the bone or there may be an incongruency in the reduction so uh, the evo nail has got a less curve of 150 and this increases more the smith and nevio nail so if you use a smith and nevio it has got a more curvature so one should understand Uh, what are the available nails in the market and what is the uh, curvature coming to the tibia nail uh, there are two different designs the gross kemp had a this is the popular nail crocking nail with a proximal bend and five within 5 cm and uh, evo modified later for some reason taking telling about the biomechanics that it is better to have a bend more distal but again for all practical purposes they they, they again uh the proximal bend is more preferred uh, for easy entry into the medullary canal rather than using the uh bend at a more distal spot hoop stress this is very important um so the circumferential expansion of the bone when you put the nail in when you put a nail in always i tell my, the, my juniors you know don't force it you just simply rotate and go in after reaming your nail should go in easily if you're going to use lot of axial force or use a hammer to push it in it may break the bone and is a good habit after every two hammering you wait for few seconds for the bone to expand and then again you you force it if you continuously force it any force in orthopedics is a disaster and it will it will break the bone because of large hoop stress hoop stress which is going to split the bone who are they when the hoop stress is more either your bone is touching one side of the your nail is touching one side of the bone and it's not uh, you know uh, going forward that means the nail geometry is wrong or your entry point is wrong most of the time your entry point is wrong and that is the reason why you break the bone now coming to the length of the nail so now you understood what nail to take what material you selected now what is the length of the nail i'm going to do how how we going to measure which i'll come to in minute so there are two when i talk about length of the nail that is the total length of the nail what is the working length then working length is nothing but <clears throat> the part of the nail which is which is has no contact with the bone so the part the part of the nail which is, doesn't have any contact with the bone it will not have a load sharing uh, effect so what i mean the nail which is not in good contact with the bone that will act like a load bearing device so that is the called the working length so when we say working length it's not 
necessarily it is between the two bolts above and below. If we have a ream nicely, if the reaming is and uh, the nail is stuck fitting, the working length becomes very, very short. That means that even the proximal and distal, the nail is well engaged, then the working length is less. So uh, this is what you should understand. The working length is the nail length spanning the fratricide from the distal point of the fixation, the proximal fragment to the proximal point of fixation, distal fragment. So nail which is the unloaded is the working length. So working length is affected by the how you do or what type of nail or lot locking or reaming. And the working length is proportional, is inversely proportional. The stiffness of a nail is inversely proportional to working length. When, what I mean by that? When the working length is more, <clears throat> the, the nail is less stiff. That is the lane, the nail can bend. And uh, again, the torsional stiffness also is less when the becomes less when the working length is more. So both are inversely proportional. Shorter the working length, more long, more stronger the fixation. That means when the working length is less, uh, it is the, uh, the, the strain taken uh, is becomes less, it is more stronger and more rigid. So when you want to become less rigid, you, you need to make the working length wider. So that is, you're making the more controlled movement at the fracture side. So this is the general principle one should understand. Diameter of the nail matters a lot. The most important factor, it, uh, the thicker the nail, the bending stiffness is more. And uh, the locking bolts, again, determines this, the, the, the strength of the nail. And generally speaking, the nail hole size should not exceed 50% of the nail diameter. So the locking bolt size should not exceed 50% of the diameter. Otherwise, it will be a stress riser at that level. And uh, the locking bolts used in humerus is generally 4 to 5 mm because nail diameter starts from 6, 7 to 8. And in tibia, it is generally 5 to 6 mm. And the interlocking screws, how, uh, how it works, it again is a, is a point of load transference. So it has got a four point bending load that is the cortex, <coughs> the nail above the outer, outer diameter of the uh, cylinder and again the near far cortex. So the four point bending loads act in the screw. And uh, if the screw is going to be load bearing, then that is the first side it may fail or loosen. So that you should understand. The location of the distal locking screw affects the biomechanics of the fracture. That is very important. If you have a locking bolt far off from the fracture side, that means the, the stability is is going to be less theoretically. But if you use their, use their reamed nail with the locking board distal, then your working length is, uh, is going to be short. So you're not worried about the, um, uh, the distance of the, the bolt from the fracture side. This holds true one in a solid nail where you don't ream and where you put a locking bolt very far apart, then uh, there is a high chance that yeah, the, there will be breakage of the bolt on the because the force resisting is less. Locking bolts again, there are different configurations because sometimes you see angled locking bolts, sometimes not uh, 90 degrees to the nail, that is a 90 degree locking bolts and going in different directions. It has been well proven in all the studies, except in upper tibia, the orientation of the distal, the locking screws doesn't have any implication on the stability or the biomechanical construct of the nail. So only in upper tibia it has been proven the oblique, various oblique, obliquity has got increasing the strength of the construct uh, compared to the transverse or the conventional locking bolts which goes 90 degrees to the long, long axis of the nail. In other areas, the distal femur, proximal femur, it doesn't matter both all the any directions it serves the same purpose effects of the nail on on the the local effects when you do a reaming you are as i said earlier damage the endoscopic blood supply it increases the temperature and you run a risk of fat necrosis fat embolism that is again a biggest uh, problem and uh, this is true uh, with, uh, especially it becomes clinically significant only if the if you have a lung injury Otherwise, it's not a big issue. 
So always is a good habit to watch the pulse oximeter when you dream. And uh, if you if you insert the all the the pressure inside is going to be uh, not too much. But when you insert a reamer, the pressure, inframillary pressure, increases up to 500 to 1,500 mercury, which is really high. And this can shovel in the fat inside the uh, blood. And this, this extravasation of fat can get embedded in the lungs and you get ARDS. So the solid embolization is a big problem and it's been well documented uh, by, by Papi's study as well as Venda's study. Uh, the transesophageal echo has clearly shown when every time when you ream, there'll be showering of uh, embolization happening in the pulmonary vessels. And uh, so clinically, this is of importance. So uh, it's been well proven. When you insert a nail, go slow, you know, so slow, steady insertion you don't increase the inframillary pressure. So there's a less chance of getting the embolization. Again, when you put a guide wire, there is a chance that you can increase the pressure. When you're reaming, again, don't go fast, you go slow. And uh, this is of significance more in femur, but not in not much in tibia. Slow insertion, definitely <clears throat> slow reaming, definitely reduces the chance of embolization. And inserting a distal vent, has been proven with the studies that it's of no use at all. So no distal venting like drilling is necessary before you read. And uh, hollow nail definitely has got a minor chance of, uh, uh, definitely reduces the chance of embolization uh, compared to the solid nail. So uh, reaming has got an impact, but the when you ream, always make sure you do go reaming slowly, steadily, and uh, no rapid reaming no fast reaming. And the intramolary nail, um, if you're going to use in a, in a polytrauma situation, definitely if there is a severe respiratory problem, then you should think seriously whether you should go for damage control orthopedics like external fixator and come in later once the lung injury recovers and then you go for uh, intramolary nailing as an exchange procedure. So these are the, the problems with reaming. But the current consensus says, when if you compare dream and undreamed femoral nail, femoral nail dreaming is the gold standard in all isolated fractures, uh, irrespective of the so many problems which we discussed earlier. And uh, only indication is, only uh, contraindication for reamed femoral nailing is patients who are a severe lung injury or desaturating under the polytrauma situation. That is the only indication where you could think about undreamed femoral nail because of short surgical time, decreased blood loss and uh, in polytrauma situation. In tibial intramillary nailing, <clears throat> the incidence of extravasation, pulmonary embolization is less, only 19%, but high in femoral fractures, nearly 78%. And uh, uh, the venous drainage of tibia is, um, um, it, it is less extensive than femur. And also the reamed, unreamed choice uh, depends on the soft tissue status. If the if you have a Gustlow 3B fracture, undreamed nail is preferred because you don't want to jeopardize the inframillary blood supply, and also the chance of infection also is less if you use the undreamed nail. Then regarding the patient positioning, I'll just go very quickly. The the fracture table um, you can use either a fracture table or a standard ready loosened OT table. It's your choice. And the, the personal experience and the preferences you may have either supine position or lateral position. And uh, generally speaking, whichever you are comfortable and confident and you've been trained, please stick on to them. No need to change because somebody is doing in a different position. And uh, if you're comfortable doing in a fracture table, please do that. Or if you're com comfortable doing in a supine lady loosened table, please stick on to that. But you need to know the techniques of how to reduce these fractures. The, the sequence of uh, stabilization of multiple extremities, if you are asked, if you're asked, you know, you have a pelvic fracture, tibia fracture, femur fracture, how, how I'm going to start? Always you start with femur first, then you go to the tibia, then pelvis, spine on the upper limb. So this is the sequence uh, generally followed for a quick stability of the fracture. 
of uh, uh, the patient, not not necessarily the fracture, the, for the patient to stabilize him quickly. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the preoperative planning, as I, as I said earlier, any preoperative planning, general condition of the patient, pulmonary injury, choice of nail, the suitable length, diameter, closed nailing techniques, locking options, everything you do a plan before you, you start the procedure. And the fracture anatomy, the location, the articular involvement, femoral bow, all these you assess. And then choice of nail in femur, either you're going to use the uh, ID fracture, PFN, the proximal femoral nail is good enough, gold standard. Long PFN is used if the ID fracture extends beyond the lesser trochanter or subtrochanteric, or if it's a fragility fracture, you need to go for a long PFN. If it is an, an uh, diaphyseal or metaphyseal fractures, anti-grade pyriformis entry or a trochanteric entry anti-grade femoral nail is good enough. And if the distal femoral metaphyseal fractures or for some reason the patient, the patient is morbidly obese or you have a metal in the proximal femur, then retrograde femoral nail is the, is the choice. Um, so what is the way the retrograde femoral nail is, um, is done? So it can be done for any fractures of the femur, but generally we prefer to look at femoral nail if there is a floating knee situation or if there's an implant in the proximal femur or if the patient is pregnant where you want to reduce the radiation exposure to the fetus. So maybe you need to go for a retrograde uh, nailing, which is a closed uh, nailing technique. And again, a polytrauma situation uh, being uh, in a supine, you can't change the position of the patient or if there is, has got a serious open pelvic fractures, uh, which, uh, which you where you cannot put the patient on a fracture table, maybe is a good option to go consider the retrograde uh, nailing, again, obese or morbidly obese patients. So the, you need to understand when to do what. And nail, the length of the nail, again, when you come to, coming to the femur, you are, we always measure from the greater trochanter tip to the superior pole of the petala, clinically, that's the surface marking used, middle joint line, the tibia to the anterior aspect to the ankle. And again, in humerus, from the angle of acromion to the lateral epicondyle and then you minus two centimeters. These are the preoperative measurements and you know what size nail you're going to use. If you're going to you, in intraoperatively, the best way to measure is uh, using the guide wire, the two guide wires of same length, you know how much inside you can be spot on. But other ways are radiolucent rulers can be used, which you put, uh, put on the top of the femur and you need to radiate the whole length. Same, the same uh, different size nail also can be used. So, radiolucent ruler, ruler or a guide wire technique is the foolproof technique to get the correct length of the nail. Nail diameter, you need to assess the isthmus diameter. And always, I said, from the you measure, you make from the isthmus 1.5 mm above, uh, and uh, you ream accordingly and put a snipe for a tight, snug fitting nail. Coming to surgical incision, <clears throat> very important in the femur, always you make incision 10 to 15 centimeters away, away from the tip of the trochanter. More obese the patient, I make an incision more higher up. That is because it should be in line with the medullary canal. A small proximal incision with the special jigs uh, are easy. Don't make incision just above the tip of the trochanter. The common mistake which the learners, they do, and if you put a all and you put an entry point, you will you will uh, go and touch the medial posterior medial cortex and uh, it may blow out uh, with the nail which you're going to push it in. So the easy entry, the correct entry point is crucial for intramedullary nail. So good in a, in a supine position, good flexion adduction of the hip facilitates proper entry. And uh, important landmarks are the greater tro trochanter, the lateral femoral condyle. When you're positioning the patient in the fascia table, you need to understand how much rotation you're giving in the distal femur. And always I insist, the person who's going to operate must do, do the positioning. Otherwise, you, do, you don't know how much you are rotating the distal femur, whether too much internal or external, and you may tend to lock in an abnormal rotational uh, <coughs> discrepancy. So that should not happen. And... Uh, Pyriformis entry nail, very easy. The foci is along the medial 
down slope of the greater, greater trochanter, very easy to locate. And uh, always you make sure in the long axis of the AP and also the lateral view, you are spot on the pyriform is aiming towards the long axis of the femur. And uh, <clears throat> the angle-degrade femoral nail is inserted in this entry. And again, the long PFN also can be done in the same entry. This is the typical entry point of a uh, intramillary nail to the pyriformis entry. And uh, if you go in, the nail reduces the fracture. Here, the nail reduces the fracture. If you have a pyri pyriformis entry centromillary nail, but other nails doesn't reduce the fracture. If you use a, uh, the, uh, the other uh, entry, the pyriform, other than pyriformis entry, then you need to have the reduction before the you put the nail in because nail cannot do the reduction for you. <clears throat> this is another example of a pyriformis entry nail uh, straight into uh, cent uh, You see the nail does the reduction for you. And here, this is again, uh, this is a implant failure. And uh, you can see the nail is broken at the proximal locking site. And here, to change the entry point, uh, I thought the using the same type of implant, you can never win over. And you need to change the cephalomedullary nail. And the easy way to do this is don't take the proximal nail off. You make an entry point first with an awl, you'll prepare with the stay with the awl, uh, get an anti anterior, uh, these, uh, the just middle to the greater to, uh, trochanter, the uh, PFN nail, make an entry, then you remove the uh, broken nail. And if you put in here, the nail will be lateralized more and you get a proper uh, PFN entry. And this, this nail <coughs> serves the purpose of how we want it. A nail entry point, the great trochanter um, entry, as I said earlier, the, uh, you need to understand the what type of nail you are selecting, the valgus angulation, whether it has got a less than four degree, that means medial great trochanter entry is the preferred choice for the PFN. And some of the nails is too much trochanteric entry nails has got more than four degrees valgus angulation here tip of the trochanter is the choice of entry. So project, correct trajectory for entry is important depending on the type of nail you are using. This is the just medial to the trochanter. So troch <clears throat> this is the classical PFN, the proximal femoral nail, just medial to tip of trochanter, not the pyriformis. And this is actually anterior to the long axis so that it, it can take two screws uh, ideally into the neck, neck and head of the uh, femur in the dead center. So this nail um, entry is different from the conventional nail. The, all the cephalometry nails has got a slightly anterior entry in the middle to the trochanter. This is a retrograde femoral nail. Again, the entry point, a radiographic mark on the trochlear groove. Actually, it is just anterior to the piece of insertion. How we do the <coughs> start with the starting reamer in a total knee replacement. And the lateral view, see the Blumen Satz line and the anterior end of the Blumen Satz line is the radiographic mark. And usually it is in the long axis of the femur. So uh, the correct entry point is important. So distal uh, femur femoral nail stacked in from the lower end to the bar. Uh, and uh, this should go parallel to the shaft to get a correct protection. The tibial nail, all with the tibial nail, the problem is the tibia is not a, uh, exactly triangular bone. If you see the medial surface of the tibia, it's dead, dead straight. I mean, the lateral side is dead straight and the middle side is more flatter. So it is, a, it is like a wedge, uh, uneven wedge. And here the entry point can be done, should be done always just medial to the tibial crest. That is important. If you're on the crest, you may slide off. So just middle to tibial crest, you are dead center on the medullary canal. And the, uh, so you need to understand the ana cross-sectional anatomy. And it should be done more than 100 degree flexion. That is again important. If a flexion of the knee is less, you may strike on the posterior cortex and you may break the posterior wall of the tibia. So always flex more than 900 degree, 90 degrees to get a proper entry to the medullary canal. And the Herzog's bend 
<clears throat> again makes the nail to go in the proper way. And the, <clears throat> if you have a fracture too proximal, you have difficulty in passing the nail. So you just need to understand certain technical aspects, which I'll come later. So this is the classical uh, tibial nail. And the humerus has got two entry sites. There are two types of nail. One is a lateral entry nail, which has got a valgus angle, just lateral to the, just medial to the tuberosity here. This is a lateral entry nail, and it's, uh, there's an offset from the midline. A straight nail uh, is another design where you have a straight entry into the medullary canal is more medial medialized and more chance of getting the rhetoric of problems. Um, so you need to have, you need to understand there are two types of entry in humerus. Always closed direction of fracture is, uh, is more difficult in femur because of this uh, muscle bulk and also in obese patients is tough. But in a tibia, it's being a subcutaneous bone is easy to reduce. And uh, always try to understand the bio, uh, how the deforming forces work before you tend to reduce. So here are certain tips. Reducing a tibial fracture, you can di directly push-pull technique. Uh, so direct manipulation with the hand, you can reduce the fracture. And also you can distract by over-correcting over the oblique fracture. So reduction of fresh fractures in the, in, for closed intermediary nailing is easy. But in a delayed, you may need to use the special tools or traction kits. And uh, what are the ways how we can reduce the fracture? Traction, fracture table, yes, with the traction, uh, pin traction may help in a chronic, in a old, unreduced uh, fractures or uh, in a old um, uh, uh, non unions, it, you may need to use the fracture table. And also, you may need to use um, some slings or uh, direct push pull techniques or sometimes steenman pins, bone awls, point reduction clamps, all these different types of uh, uh, instruments used to get the reduction. This is an example is a, a, an oblique fracture, a spiral, long spiral oblique fracture of the tibia. So nicely reduced from outside uh, by a point reduction clamp. And once reduced, then you pass the guide wire and then you ream and then you put the, push the nail in. So this is the reduction of the fracture is important to start with before you ream. The other way is metaphysical fractures always centralize the guide wire um, in, the, <clears throat> in the distal tibia. That is very important. It should not go eccentric to one side. Always centralize on the distal tibia. And uh, femur, the, uh, what I normally do, I always use the curved all to reduce the fractures. So uh, some people use the shan spin. But this, this I find is very easy and uh, easy way to point and reduce the, you, know, the, you can push pull the way how you want to and easily manipulate the fracture fragments. And the other way described is using a shan screw, unicortical shan screws used to go in and then use the universal chuck to manipulate uh, with the T-handle and uh, get the fragments right in position. And there are other aiding systems like in Syndream, uh, you have the tip is uh, slightly curved, and this, this you can you have a straight hook, straight tip, and a curved hook, curved tip. The curved tip can be manipulated into the distal fragment. Once it's manipulated, you can rotate and pass the guide wire into the uh, distal area. So that is an, another easy way, easy aid of uh, pushing the guide wire. Then you have a distractor instrument. Um, very rarely used in, in, uh, in, uh, in our country, but in US it's very common because they uh, you, they do the nailing on the a normal radiolucent table. So fixate, fixator is uh, uh, enormously used in uh, US and you have different ways of fixing the fixator to reduce the long bones. Polar screws, this is again another, another concept of how to get a proper nail put in a, a metaphysical fracture. The polar screws are nothing but the blocking screws placed intramedullary to guide the nail in a different direction. So you want to nail in the desired position how you want to, and you want to push the nail in a different direction, then you need to use the polar screws. And um, it prevents the tran to, in order to prevent the translation of the fragments to one, one side to other side. So usually in the wide medullary canals, it will go for because of the strong pull of the muscle, it will go tend to deviate. And um, 
So what the polar screw does is um, it reduces the width of the medullary canal and it forces the intramedullary na nail to go in a different direction, the desired way how we want to get the proper alignment, stabilization, and also to manipulate the fragments. So here, always on the side close to the um, nail, you put the polar screws, that is important. So when you put close to a, a, a screw, which is bicordical or unicordical close to the intramedullary, then you're pushing the nail to one side, you're centralizing the nail uh, on the medullary shaft and trying to reduce the uh, fracture. The same, in the similar way, it is acts also, also acts as a reduction tool and uh, being a distal, sometimes it goes in, a, in, a, in the same direction, you're not able to change the direction of the nail. You put a screw in there and then you uh, pass the guide wire and rim, rim more, uh, more laterally and you can, you can pass the nail in that desired position to, to get a proper reduction. And this is an, an example, a clinical example, where I put a screw on more lateral to push, to get the nail in more medial, to prevent uh, more uh, virus. And uh, probably if I had to put a screw here, even this reduction I could have achieved. And uh, see, uh, this is another example, is a non-union. The nail is going in a different direction in the valgus position. So this valgus and anterior position of the nail I want to change. So I put a screw very close here to change the direction and my reaming is changed. My direction bolt has changed and also <clears throat> the direction of the nail is completely changed. This is difficult in a pre-existing track. So, but that, that is a, this is a very definitive way of using polar screws to change the direction of the nail, how you want to uh, place it. But instead of polar screw, I find very easy to use a steam and pin using the same principle. This is upper tibia fracture. So I, I straight away put the, um, uh, the steam and pin medial and also another pin more anterior, uh, more posterior so that I can direct the nail accordingly, my guide wire. So this automatically gets the reduction back, putting a, a steamman pin like a polar screw, uh, using like a polar screw. So this is how I do. I don't use a polar screw wasting the time. Sequence of reduction, many people uh, do either proximal locking, distal locking, but as long as you understand the concept, either you can do either distal locking first and then Backstroke, uh, you can with the backstroke technique, you can compress the fracture and then do a proximal locking. But if a nail is long, it may protrude and uh, you may have a nail irritation. But I always do the other way around. I always lock proximally and then adjust distally. But always distal, I leave 5 mm uh, gap between the epifacial scar and the tip of the nail so that I can play with. And uh, this is a, again, a more proximal fracture. Um, here you can see the nail is uh, too proud, um, which is not a desirable way. So control the length of the layer. So you should have a good control of uh, what uh, the length of the nail, how we're going to lock, which one proximal or distal first and understand the concepts. Because checking the alignment, the easy way to check the virus valgus is using the uh, <clears throat> the cautery wire, you can uh, pass on from the center of the head of the femur uh, to the ankle and then check whether it causes, crosses just the midline of the uh, knee joint. So if all three are correct, that means your axial alignment, the mechanical alignment is good. There is no virus valgus at the uh, fracture site. So this is what you check. And for the rotation, there are different ways to check the rotation. Yeah, you can check the lesser, lesser trochanter anatomy. You can check the, uh, the dimension of the cortex. The cortical mismatch indicates that uh, there is a rotational malalignment. And also the step sign, um, <clears throat> the, diameter the, the diameter difference between the proximal and distal fragment again indicates there is a rotational um, uh, malalignment. So cortical step sign, diameter difference, the lesser trochanter shape all indicates that. And uh, for distal locking nowadays, the recent distal aiming device has come. Uh, there are a lot of uh, new technologies, uh, even with the magnetic locking device has come. 
and uh, this is a new armament theorem in the market. And coming to uh, the end of my talk, the fragility fracture, the concept is uh, always all the fragility fractures, very elderly, too elderly, it is always preferred to put a long nail um, spanning across the whole bone. That is important. For example, you have even a uh, trochanteric fracture. Long PFN is a, is a better choice than using a short PFN because you spanned across the whole bone. So there is no uh, chance of stress rising at the tip of the nail. For example, here this patient had a fracture at the tip of the uh, previous DHS implant and I, we need to use a retrograde nail uh, so that it, uh, it spans across the, the whole um, uh, bone is spanned completely with the implant. So no chance of any stress rising at any point. Uh, so that is important. So any fragility fracture too elderly or a peri-implant fracture, it is a good choice to span across completely. This is again another uh, example of a peri-implant, the fragility fracture in a, in a eight year old, uh, no chance of doing a short PFN or short fixations. Um, so here the best implant is always span across the whole length and you lock with a cephalo medullary name. That is the preferred choice. And again, uh, if you have a metastasis, it, it is uh, easy to say that you can use a unicortical gross kempf nail or a simple universal uh, femoral nail, but it's not a good choice. You should always use the cephalo medullary nail to, sp to uh, splint the whole bone. So that is so that it doesn't break at another spot because you don't know whether there is any skip lesions or not. So span the whole bone, that is very important. So completely, all these nails are not without any complications. If you have a wrong entry or you bash with too much of force the nail in, you may break the neck, the femoral neck, and femoral neck fracture is a bad news. And if it happens, it's a disaster, and you may it may go for even evas necrosis. And in case if it happens, you may, you may need to do a mesonail uh, cancellous screw fixation of the femoral neck fracture. Malalignment is uncommon in nailing. When I say malalignment, the angulatory uh, alignment mismatch is uncommon. Only if it happens in the diaphragm, metaphysics it can happen. Rotational malalignment has been reported up to 10 percent. So that is why I said the person who does the nailing should position the patient sure that uh, nail is in proper rotation, the uh, femur is in proper rotation, the foot is facing forwards, the second toe is in alignment to the petala, that is very important. And short, shortening is again rare, the dentist dependency is rare, infection can happen in one person of the patients, in the femur and the open tibia, the incidence is high, DVT is not un uncommon and the fat embolism the chance can be lessened by femur irrigator aspirator system. Prochantric pain, as I said, the nail is proud. The anterior knee pain in femur, in tibia nailing, all these are not uncommon. Heterotropic ossification has been reported of the various incidents, hardware failure from non-union, no palsy, sciatic no palsy, uh, potential no palsy from the traction, uh, the center pole, so adequate padding must be given, avoid excessive traction, and uh, no surgery should exceed more than one to, uh, you know, two hours. If that case, you need to re release the traction, give some time, and then read, uh, restart again. Compartment syndrome is not uncommon. The tibia, the infection, as I said earlier, open fracture is nearly 5 to 15%, depending on what type of gastillo type they have. Non-union. And uh, is, is again in the more common in the open fractures. Malunion in metaphysical fractures is not uncommon, but it's quite, you know, it can happen in metaphysical fractures, more common in proximal than distal. So, this is an example of uh, virus interludation. You can see uh, one, the easy way sometimes for the beginners to understand whether the tibia is in virus or valgus is you take a CM picture of the knee. You, 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 in a straight line, you bring the C arm down to see the parallelity of the articular surface of ankle. If no, if both are not 
parallel, that means there is a virus or valve still. That is one of the easy ways to understand whether there is any residual 5 to 10 degrees virus or valgus. The another easy way is look at the fibula. Fibula will tell you clearly whether there is virus or valgus. Sometimes it's so deceptive here, you may think you are okay with the tibial, with this tibial nail, but here it really shows up, you know, it is in severe, in severe virus. And with the internal rotation added up, the virus will be very prominent. And uh, so this, these sort of problems, uh, you can uh, avoid if you know that you the rotation you check with the second toe to the tibial tuberosity or the center of the petula, or you draw the uh, use the cautery wire from center of the hip to the center of the ankle, and also you know the the cortic cortex mismatch and the look at the fibula and also the joint length parallelity of the knee joint and the ankle. So there are various ways to check the reduction. Insufficient screws again is a problem. Some of the uh, you know uh, screw is nailings I've seen, and it definitely is a there'll be a high chance of non-union. You'll be lucky to have this fracture heal if you don't respect the biomechanics. So always respect the biomechanics. Another common problem is the length of the nail is too long. It may act like a non-union strut because you distracted the fracture site. And because of distraction, why distraction has happened? Because you've forgotten to see the nail is touching the fascian scar. Fascian scar is a very strong uh, bony bar. And once the nail touches this, it slowly deforms the distal tibia. So it is going to valgus. And again, if you keep hammering above, then it goes for gapping. So if you see this X-ray, this is a non-union construct, 100% from day one. So you don't wait for it to get established. Immediately you redo the procedure and change the nail. And always I make a principle, I always park the nail tip at least 5 mm above the facial scar to do the final adjustments. Uh, very rarely we park in the facial scar uh, unless the fracture is too distal, where I feel that uh, metafacial, the, the contact here is very important to prevent rotation. So. Always you think about the principle. Heterotrophic ossification is again not uncommon in the entry site, um, especially in the femur. And the nail here is again proud and it can cause trochantric bursitis. So um, I've given a very elaborate lecture and um, I could touch most of the things in nailing because of uh, time constraint. I've I, I told you the basic things, uh, basic principles. The closed intramedullary nail is the treatment of choice for all diabetes long bone fractures. And even is in, a, in, a, in the metaphysical, nowadays I'd say, even for metaphysical diabetes long bone fractures, closed intramedullary nailing is the, better, is the treatment of choice. It's got an obvious advantage of minimal blood loss, minimally invasive. The biology is preserved because the fracture hematoma is preserved. Again, your reaming increases the autograft at the fracture site, making it to a heel faster and it's a load sharing device and the fracture heals with the external callus and uh, the entry point is very very crucial correct entry point you know, according to the nail what you're going to use is very important you can't put a proximal femoral nail with the pyriformis entry or you can't do the other way around uh, the central medullary nail with a pi with a uh, medial trochantric entry so all these will change the reductions. You will break the femur. So no force in uh, nailing. Always the disasters happen in theater because you put a lot of force or, is, or somebody new will hammer the nail to, to shovel in. And uh, whenever you're going to use hammer, that means something wrong is happening. You think a moment, don't use force. Think what is the, what is the problem and start from first again. So correct entry point is very crucial. Nail diameter is the most important determinant of nail strength. You take it from me one point today, the nail length and nail diameter is the most crucial thing determining the nail strength. And as I said, is fourth to the fourth power of the diameter. So one mm increase tremendously increases the strength. Ream nail is the gold standard. No need to think about the unreamed nail and all the other options. So uh, ream nail, Closed interval nailing, 
is the choice for all division long bone fractures. So thanks once again for listening this uh, long lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Bala. Unmute, Hello? sir. Bala, Bala, sir, you please unmute, sir. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Rex. That was wonderful talk. I uh, have covered everything A to Z about nailing. That's um, you have not left any stone unturned. So it's uh, fantastic. I really enjoyed. You gave a lot of practical tips at the end, which is really, really useful. Uh, thanks once again. Tanapan, um, is there a provision for asking questions? Or, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so though it is late, I'm sure uh, somebody will have. Uh, some there are some questions in chat box. Okay. I. Uh, all right. Okay. Rex, sir, you can uns unshare your screen, yeah. sir. Rex? Uh, yes, sir. yes, yes. Can you see that? Uh, what's the ideal time for dynamization for FEMA? Uh, there is uh, no hard and fast uh, you know, rule or uh, no exact timings. Mm -hmm. The most important thing, when you think about dynamization, mm -hmm. you need to understand that there must be enough stability at the fracture site to prevent rotation or uh, telescoping. So that means you need to wait at least 8 to 12 weeks for some consolidation of the callus. Okay. Before consolidation of callus, you're going to dynamize it, you may lose the length, it may telescope, and it can rotate, and the, the, the role of dynamization is gone. So, the best time, I would say, maybe 12 weeks, and the late, maybe up to six months. Okay, okay. Right, there is another question. Uh, in segmental both bone forearm fractures, uh, would you advise both bone plating or one plating and one tense nailing, which is best option? If you are talking about adults, mm -hmm. segmental fracture, I prefer only plating. Okay, okay. Uh, nailing is out of out of question. Very rarely we have used uh, nail for forearm uh, fractures, segmental, especially if it is an open fracture. Okay. It's a very is an industrial crush injuries. Sometimes with no soft tissues mm -hmm. seen, then those those scenarios uh, we have used uh, you know square nails or tense nails. Okay, okay. But not otherwise. In kid, in children, yes, you can use uh, tennis nail is the first choice in children. Okay. In exchange nailing, uh, bone grafting is always mandatory or exchange during exchange nailing? Would you uh, bone graft? Yeah. No, yes, uh, first of all, uh, I think the principle of uh, healing you should understand. You know, what, why this non-union has failed. So that is important. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, if you understand the principle why it has failed, then you will know the solution. For example, if you have a transverse fracture of a femur, which has gone for non-union because of either the nail length is short or because the nail diameter is small or because the patient didn't cooperate or early weight bearing and metal, fatigue failure of the metal, these things probably a simple exchange nailing uh, in, a, in a dynamized mode will work, right? But if there is a comminuted fracture, a long comminution, and uh, you feel that less than one third contact of the bone, and where you only, uh, by just doing exchange nailing, I'm not going to bridge the gap. And I hear, uh, definitely I, mean, I need to augment the fixation with the bone grafting. Bone grafting. Okay. And also make sure the fracture fragments are put back to normal place because some of the segmental fractures or combinations may be out of the way. So if you're going to open, then definitely I bone graft in addition to the proper nailing. Uh, what is um, axially stable fractures? Can you explain? It's a good question. When I say axially stable, the it must be a load sharing principle that the cortical contact between the proximal and distal fragment must be good enough. Okay. See, uh, you see even the subtragantic fractures mm -hmm. uh, from the Halifax itself, they put a long gamma nail with no distal locking. Oh. No, no distal locking, only proximal locking, but the very snug fitting nail. Because the working length here 
is very close, you know, because it's it's uh, the the whole nail is not fitting throughout. Here, uh, the the geometry of the fracture is transverse or short oblique, so selection of the fracture is important. So here it loads it acts like a load sharing device, and only axial axial load is permitted, and rotate the bending stress is being neutralized, and also there is no lateral shear stress. Because the nail, you are correct. You are done the correct size. The no side to side movement, and definitely is not going to collapse or telescope because there is a good cortical contact. So bone gives stability. Implant also gives stability. So two things give stability. You are not dependent on the implant for the stability. So this is the axial. controlled axial movement. Okay, right. I have a question. In yes. proximal tibia fracture, proximal one third. Yes. Yes. Uh, the proximal fragment always goes. Uh, always goes. Yeah, extended. Okay. Yes. I always find difficult. So, uh, give me some uh, tips. See, uh, I mean, uh, there are many ways to do this. You, whenever you flex too much, it will go for more extension. Yeah. So, ideally speaking, you know, you need you should not extend too much when you do this uh, nailing of the upper tibia, but. You can't get a proper entry if you don't flex. Yeah. So what I normally do, I get my assistant to really, you know, uh, tag on to the tibial tuberosity, push it really more than 90 degrees to get the entry. Okay. Sometimes it's difficult, but I, that's what I do. <laughs> it's easy to and, say. <laughs> yeah, it is difficult. Maybe supracondylar, uh, the the su suprapetalar approach, maybe uh, maybe good for uh, this. The suprapetalar nailing may be good if you have a jig for that. Uh, but why? What I always do is I always put a steenman pin in the posterior aspect of the tibia mm -hmm. uh, as a polar screw, which I showed in my, one of okay. the X-rays, uh, to so that the guide wire always tries to be more anterior, parallel to the anterior cortex, and uh, try to ex uh, not to flex too much when you do this, and also very rarely. We also try to put a small point addition clamp, if possible, between the proximal and distal fragment whenever we flex to keep it in position. Mm -hmm. So when you try to flex, it doesn't extend up. Okay. There are there are also literature to say to put a small plate, like a two-hole yeah. or three-hole plate in extension to keep it in position or to yeah. use a small K-wire uh, positioning uh, device with this one, a plate. And then you flex and do this uh, nail, nailing. Yeah. So uh, one need to understand is that it's a tough situation, but there are ways to do it. Okay. Will that uh, headstock bend make any difference uh, reducing it? Uh, no, no headstock any nail, bend. Any different nail? Uh, I see uh, the the nail cannot reduce the fracture. I know. Uh, that is very you know uh, you may think the headstock bend. May try to we, we it doesn't help to reduce, but it helps yeah. to displace. It helps to displace only. Yes, right. <laughs> it doesn't, that's doesn't what, help to reduce. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Need... Uh, sir, I, I have a feeling that uh, if you can maintain the reduction till reaming, mm -hmm. definitely there uh, your uh, your nail will not uh, displace it. Okay. But uh, if you when you are reamed already in a displaced position and you're trying to put a nail. In through the same spot, you know, through the same track which you already drill a dream, definitely it's not going to reduce your fracture and you're going to be in soup. Okay. And one other tip which I can tell you, if you if you in case if there's a small disparity, mm -hmm. you can try to reduce the size of the nail, you'll be able to reduce the fracture. That is another okay. tip. Okay, okay. Uh, one last question. Yes, sir. Um, why the non-union is more common in transverse fractures, yes. uh, tibial, transverse tibial fractures, though it will allow immediate weight bearing? You mean the closed tibial fracture? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't have much of XP. I mean, I don't have not seen much of non-union in the transverse tibial fracture, especially if it is closed and uh, um, as I said earlier, I mean the, the problem is when you when you put a nail in, mm -hmm. with the proper proper length is very important. What common mistake which I have seen is this transverse fracture, even if it's minutely distracted, for example, more than three mm or two mm distracted, definitely there is a high chance of 
down here because the surface area of contact is very less. Yeah. That is number one. Second thing is there must be good cooperation of the fracture when you finish the procedure. Even if there is a mild distraction, you have to think why the distraction has happened. Either because your nail is too tight, which has taken the distal fragment along with it because the isthmus of the tibia is distal. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is uh, for the students to understand the isthmus of tibia is in the proximal two-third distal one-third junction. So when you put a sometimes a tight-fitting nail, it may distract if there is a fracture in the mid, mid diaphysis. And this, and you, and if you don't recognize this when you, before you lock it, so I always make sure after proximal locking, you need to give a lot, lot of push and bang on the uh, heel to close the gap, and then we do the distal locking. That is very, very important technically. Another thing which I have noted the nail tip, if you park it in the subchondral bone or in the facial scar, and you are locked already proximally you can never collapse the tibia. Mm. And invariably, this will end up in non-union. So maybe, I think it's more of a technical rather than the anatomy. Right. Thank you, Rex. It's one, more question, sir. one more question for the sir. One more question. There is an, yes, one sir. more question for the subject. Sir, yes, sir. For nailing after uh, initially fixing with the external fixator. It's uh, one of the common questions asked to be postgraduates. OK. Uh, so, if you are put an external fixator for an open fracture, if you're going for the exchange into a definitive procedure, the first the idle time is seven within seven to ten days. After seven to ten days, this you know the the bad time is the second insult is the second week, and all these systems because most of the times you put an external fixator because they, there is a systemic inflammatory response, and uh, here if you can't get this definitive procedure within seven to ten days. And you're going to do on the second week, you are you are really in trouble. You know, you're triggering the second insult, number one. Second thing is anything after second week, if you're going to do na the exchange uh, nailing or you know, you're changing the definitely procedure, high chance of infection is there. Uh, because the pin track sites becomes the infected and uh, the soft tissues are still recovering. So it is not a good idea to immediately change external fixator to nailing on on the uh, on the day when you remove it if you want the best time is if you if you left the external fixator long for soft tissue to heal for example 6 weeks is the best time to remove the external fixator give some time for the soft tissue to, the pin tracks to heal maybe you can put in a uh, plaster of paris abony slab or whatever for the tibia and then you ten, 10 days or two weeks for the wounds to settle, make sure your, your ESR, CRP is normal. Then you, after two weeks' time, a resting time, you go for the nailing. So you reduce the chance of infection. So either best time is first one week or after six weeks, you do a stage, staged uh, nailing, not immediately. Thank you, sir. Sir, Dr. Trinarayan here, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, wonderful lecture, sir. You covered How completely you? the news, sir, from, uh, I think, uh, given complete coverage. So, my yes, just have this two doubts, sir. Yes, so one sir. is, uh, when do you primarily decide to, you know, graft in a nail? Even if you do a close nail. So, sometimes you have a doubt whether to graft this or whether you know whether it is a heel or not. And next is, you know, when, uh, till how long you wait? You do a primary nail. Now, uh, you don't see adequate callus. You know, how long you wait and what you tell the patient, how long you wait? Or do a secondary procedure like a grafting or uh, you know exchange nailing uh, or grafting. Yeah, How long that's a good, good question. The, the first question, I have never bone grafted with the primary nailing at any point of time, especially in a closed closed wounds. No, I have never bone grafted so far. <coughs> and I don't see any indication for primary bone grafting in a closed long bone fracture because you uh, the the whole advantage of closed nailing is lost once you open. And uh, if you're going to plan a bone grafting, the best thing is you know, after six to eight weeks is the best time. But uh, as the second, regarding the second question, there are certain fractures which we know definitely needs bone grafting. For example, too much coming or too much shattered, or if there is a bone loss where you need to come in definitely for a bone grafting. I don't wait for a long time. 
I, I normally tell my patients in six, four to six weeks time, we'll go back, do a bone grafting. And so by the end of three months, you are back to normal. So this is my protocol where I strongly feel bone grafting is necessary. The second scenario where you expect a healing, but it's not happening. So here, normally you need to wait for at least three months, at least three months to make sure the, the callus is not adequate or it is going the every third or fourth week, the progress, once the progress has come to a standstill, both clinically, radiologically, where you don't see any progress, possibly that is the best time. So maybe I would say after three to four months is the best time to decide where you expect the healing, but doesn't heal, then you can think about dynamization or bone grafting. Thank you, sir. Sir, and one more just advice for the postgraduates. So yes. they have always the confusion when to allow weight bearing in a transverse fracture and in a commutative fracture. So when do you, you know, what the message you want to give the PGs to, you know, advise them when to allow weight bearing to the what advice they will give to the patient. Sometimes yes. they allow very early weight bearing and sometimes they don't allow weight bearing at all for a very long time. Yes. So yes. what is the ideal time for weight bearing? So it all depends on how good your construct of bone is. So as I said earlier, uh, you know to think about the fact the the, the community the fracture anatomy the combination. The combination is there too much, and if there's no proximal and distal bone contact, definitely wait for the radiological callus to form before weight bearing. When I say weight bearing, we are talking about more than fifty percent, not toe touch. Toe, toe touch can be started from day one. That is not an issue. When, we, when I say weight bearing, the body weight is going through the leg. So here, there must be radiological callus for any comminuted fracture uh, because here the nail acts like a load bearing device, not a load sharing device. So otherwise, the nail fatigue uh, failure can happen or nail can bend, especially with the long combination. In a load, uh, in a transverse fracture <clears throat> or in a short oblique fractures where you feel that you, you've done an ideal nailing, like proper size, proper length, and proper locking, you can start then, uh, you know, weight bearing from day one. Nothing will happen. But you must have a confidence in your technique and also a confidence in your nail, what you put in, in a good quality nail, good size nail, like 12 mm nail in a transverse fracture and well locked and in a, not in an obese man. Probably I would say with support, you can walk immediately no issues at all and uh, good quality nail that is very important nail, indigenous made nail we don't know the strength the, the strength or the uh, you know the quality of the nail but all the important nails yes you can honestly you can make them to stand weight bear within the limits of comfort from day one um, for for a postgraduate to be on safe side i would say you can say, take a simple protocol six weeks toe touch weight bearing and after six weeks, you see the, uh, how, the, uh, how the healing is. The healing is, you can see some faint callus. Then you can start 25 to 30% weight bearing. Uh, that means foot flat, but again with walker. From maybe from every three weeks, we normally see from ninth week onwards, you can make them 50%. And once the callus on two cortex is good, that means two cortices is in good contact. You can make them high, you know, full weight bearing with a single stick. And once four cortex, you can take the, you know, no, no aids, uh, walking aids is necessary. So this is the protocol you can follow safely in all types of fractures. Thank you. And there are a few more questions in the chat box, sir. We have time, we can take them. I'll take it as a last question, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So some point about uh, antibody coated nailing. Some words about antibody coated nailing. Antibody coated nailing is a big topic. I mean, I'm, uh, it is a, <clears throat> you can use in a, a severely infected long bone fractures. The preparation, uh, different uh, types like using a giggly saw and then using a cement and then uh, you, the reamer, the <clears throat> exchange tube, you can cut it off and then you shovel, shovel in this. Uh, see, any the basic principle everybody should not forget. Uh, see, deprivement is the key for any uh, infection, okay? So how, however, how good you are, it is not the antibiotic nail which is going to save you, save the patient. <clears throat> so good deprivement, so good reaming, you need to make sure that all the, uh, the membranes, the, soft, the infected membranes inside has been removed thoroughly with the increased size reamers 
maybe here the ria may be of good help so once reamed thoroughly and you are sure that no residual infection macroscopically is seen all the membranes you have removed i always make sure the locking screw site i enlarge it even sometimes up to 4.5 mm diameter and i flush it <clears throat> with 6 to 12 liters of fluid with a uh, exchange tube thoroughly and make sure that it's been completely washed off and then use the antibiotic prepared antibiotic small size nail go in and we have a waiting period for 6 to 8 weeks time to make sure that no infection is brewing up or nothing is coming out and then you go for a definitive treatment of the non union so antibiotic non uh, nail per se is not the treatment i it, i would say maybe it, it helps in 10 to 20% of the whole treatment but 80% is the work of how you debride or make sure there is no soft tissue or bony infection if you have left a sequestrum in a dead focus even when you remove the antibiotic nail and put a new one with bone grafting it's going to flare up so most important as a pg how effectively you can debride the soft tissue and you should have a courage to remove all the dead bones if it is infected you know you can you can't save the dead bone you know dead bone is dead bone and you need to remove and think of the next salvage procedure rather than beating the bush okay Uh, there is no more questions. Uh, we'll call it a day. Well, I, I think we have taken enough of your time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> but it's very useful. Anyhow, uh, thanks, Rex. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thanks. everyone. Thank I you. thank uh, once again T N O A, the organizing team, Anupam T M S, uh, everybody, uh, Thiru, uh, P T S, everybody for um, this wonderful P G teaching and giving us the um, opportunity. thank you all good night and thanks for the participants especially pgs and consultant uh, consultants uh, good night everyone thank, thank you, you sir. thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir